So um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Bill. Thank you, Major. And thank you, everyone, for coming here today. You know, it's funny, yesterday I, I had asked Richard, I, I said, uh, Richard Aviles, who, who's been helping set all this stuff, I said, could you give everybody name tags so I, you know, I know who's there? And then everybody had them, and I, I swear to God, I couldn't read them. <laughs> but so when we talk today, because I want to leave time for like conversation and question and answers and a dialogue, really, you know, just uh, when you stand up, just say your name so we all know. It just makes it a little more personal. So I want to, um, you know, thank you all for being here. And I also want to really thank Patrick and Richard and Laura and Eric from the Haven Center and Tom Link, who funded this fellowship, um, for, for having me out here um, and, you know, saving me from the 80 degree weather that we had in Los Angeles. <laughs> <laughs> uh, actually, we have, you know, the downside of that is we're in the eighth year of our drought and we, uh, even though we've had some rains, we have something like only 20% of the water that we need. Uh, so that's, uh, there's a downside and there's also freeways for air quality and all of that. Anyway, so um, uh, I, uh, just a little bit about, a uh, little about my background. So uh, Patrick mentioned that for, for uh, several years I was the executive director of Communities for a Better Environment. And uh, from 2006 to 2014, and that was really some of the most gratifying work that I've ever done. Uh, but I started uh, actually as a political activist in, in Colorado, where my family's from. Our family's from the southern part of the state and from New Mexico, northern uh, New Mexico, which was, is really one geographic and e ecological unit. But after the conquest, after the United States stole that land by military force from Mexico, they carved it up into states. So there's Arizona, there's New Mexico, and there's Colorado. Uh, but that area is really uh, for the peoples that li have lived there, the native peoples and the Chicano peoples that lived there in the ecology. It was really one unit. It's artificial political religion. And uh, our family were um, lived on the land and were like uh, most people dispossessed from the land. We still have 40 acres in a little place called Trujillo Creek in uh, southern Colorado. Uh, but uh, we mostly lost the land that ended up in the coal mines. And uh, my grandfather on my mom's side was on the railroad. Um, and then I got active with a group, an organization in Denver. I grew up in Denver in the North Side Barrio. And uh, then I got active with a really remarkable group called the Crusade for Justice. It's a great name. It was a great organization. And then I, over the years, I had a chance to do different kinds of organizing, um, uh, labor organizing and community organizing and campus organizing. And then ultimately, that led me to uh, Communities for a Better Environment. And it's a... Uh, an environmental justice organization that works in four communities in California. So in Richmond, which is up near Berkeley, and that's, it's a community of about a hundred and some thousand people dominated by Chevron, which has a 3,000 acre refinery uh, in that city. And then we work in East Oakland, which is a historically African American community and now is about 50% African American and Latino, um, mostly working poor that live there. And then we also work in Los Angeles, in Southern California, in the harbor area of the city of Los Angeles, in a community called Wilmington, which is about 80% Latino. And then in the uh, southeast Los, uh, Los Angeles County cities of Southgate and Huntington Park, um, which are also um, uh, primarily Latino communities. And in Southern California, we have an organization called Youth for Environmental Justice with chapters in five high schools. So that's kind of where our and our organization uh, includes organizers and researchers and scientists and attorneys. And they, those work together on our campaigns. Those three sectors work together as uh, what we call part of our triad. And I'm going to talk about the experience of that triad today in a campaign that we did in Richmond, California, um, when Chevron wanted to build a large uh, project to start refining tar sands and dirtier grades of crude oil. And this campaign started in 2008, and it took about four years before uh, we were successful in stopping the project. Um, but a little bit about Richmond. Richmond was, is a, um, uh, a relatively small city, 103,000 people now. And it, uh, for many, many years, was a uh, primarily uh, white city. There's a small... Uh, African-American community, historic African-American community 
in North Richmond, which is actually unincorporated, and uh, ex extremely, extremely poor, and just has some really bad socioeconomic indicators. But over the years, uh, and a lot of the folks in that lived in Richmond, a lot of these uh, working class white folks, uh, worked in or near the uh, uh, in industries connected to Chevron's refinery. And these are uh, union jobs. Um, they were originally uh, oil, chemical, and atomic workers, and then they merged with the steel workers union. So they were good jobs. And even now, you can earn up to $100,000 a year in these jobs if you with overtime. But uh, over the years, as folks actually uh, accumulated uh, some uh, resources and bought homes and so on, they moved out of Richmond. So only about 7% of the workers in the Richmond, in the Chevron refinery actually live in Richmond now. And as they moved, the composition of the city changed, the demographic makeup of the city changed, and it's now overwhelmingly <laughs> people of color. And the largest community is Latino and then African American. And then there's a growing uh, Asian community, which is uh, largely Laotian. So there's been this change, there's been this demographic change, but the composition of that working class also changed. So these are folks who mainly don't work in industrialized union jobs. They mainly work in the service sectors, they work in uh, low wage construction, they work in, you know, it's just those kinds. So they're, they're also part of the working class, but they're, they're, beca uh, they're in uh, more poorly paid and unorganized sectors of the working class. And, um, uh, so, and they're, uh, one of the, the realities of their life is they don't have the wherewithal to leave. <laughs> so, uh, housing is a little bit more affordable. You know, if you live near refineries, it's, it's a little cheaper. Uh, there's some public housing uh, uh, developments uh, near the refineries. And so, they, they don't have the, the options of like, I think I'll move to the Holly, uh, I think I'll move to the Oakland Hills, or I think I'll move to San Francisco. So they're pretty much, this is where they live. And over the years, in addition to the refineries, there's been an, an expansion of freeways and other kinds of polluting industries in that area. It's more like, uh, as the composition changed, the concentration of pollution sources actually increased in, the, in those areas. And that's because these communities were communities of color, which had less wealth and less political clout um, than the previously white community. So that, that's, that's kind of a little bit of context and background. Now, Chevron has been there for over 100 years. And um, they contribute something like 40% of the city's tax revenues. So obviously, they're a huge uh, player in the city's politics and economics and social life. And one of the deals that they'd worked out, I don't know exactly the history, but ordinarily, when you want to, when you have a, uh, a operation like an oil refinery, uh, which is a huge uh, source of uh, emissions, of, of both uh, toxic emissions and greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, for any new or expansion, uh, any new part of that project or any expanded part of that project, you have to get approval from the Air Quality <coughs> Management District, which is, which is a state body. It's a regional body, um, but it's, re it's, it's under the Air Resources Board. But Chevron had worked out a deal where their ultimate approval is with the city council. So it's the city that decides. And the reason for that is because they bought the council for years. They just, they just owned the council. And Chevron actually had an office in city hall. So they, for, for a long time, they just had somebody there that just you know, would move up and down the, the, the halls and just tell people what to do, basically. So that's. Uh, so that was a little over, you know, over time that became a little too blatant and they pulled that person, but obviously they still controlled a lot of the, the strings. And um, uh, as the, uh, the, the composition of the, of the community changed, the, the challenge to Chevron increased. So people start saying, you know, this is, we, we don't accept this, that, you know, our, 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 there's uh, this constant emissions that they violate the Clean, the Clean Air Act. And, the California Environmental Quality Act, and they're putting just tons of emissions of mercury and benzene and nitrous oxide and sulfur oxides and all of these things that are just creating enormous health problems. And the, the, the experience that people had in the community just said, it just seems like every kid on the block has an inhaler. And we just have these people dying from cancer and all these other heart disease and a lot of miscarriages. And, and 
Uh, it turns out that when they did start to do some research on this, it turns out that their rates for a lot of these health problems were much higher than the county, the county averages. And they said, you know, we, we just can't accept this. And especially this activated a lot of the mothers in the community and the women in the community who were concerned with the health of their children. So this started, uh, and when CPE started, uh, the, the first members that we had were women, primarily African American and Latinas, uh, who became involved with, with CBE and said, you know, we just, uh, what can we do about this? So that's, uh, that's a little bit about the background here. Now, in the last uh, several years, as part of the political changes that have happened in Richmond, the, uh, the, the city council became a more contested arena of struggle. And in 2008, when this campaign started, actually it was in, I think, 2007, the city elected a Green Party mayor, Gail McLaughlin. And this was an indication that things were changing, and the majority of her votes were voters of color. She got a significant uh, 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 percentage of votes from the white community, which is still uh, has a large percentage of the voters because a lot of the Latino and Asian uh, communities are either the, the they're younger, so there's a lot of folks who are not yet 18, and also a lot of folks who uh, don't have uh, residency or citizenship status and so can't vote. So, but it was really uh, this, this coalition of largely voters of color and progressive whites that put her in office. And this was a, uh, what do they call it, a harbinger of change. This meant that there was a new day dawning in, in Richmond and that there was more struggle going on. Now, previous to this, even before this change happened, that we had, uh, CBE had been doing organizing in Richmond, and one of the campaigns that we had that was successful is uh, against what they call flaring. So I don't know if you've ever seen pictures of these refiners where you see fire coming out of the smokestacks. There's like Dante's Inferno. Have, have folks seen those kinds of images? Well, that's what they call flaring. And what it is is that they're, when there's a buildup of gases in their refinery operations, they can release them through the flaring process only in emergency situations. In other words, you only flare if it looks like you're going you're, you're to sh totally shut down your operation or you're going to have a, a, an accident, industrial accident, an explosion or a fire or something. So there was, there was laws on the books that said you could only flare in, in emergency situations. And flaring releases just enormous amounts of toxics and greenhouse gases. So in addition to the normal pollution, and the number one industrial polluter in California is this Chevron refinery, the number one industrial greenhouse gas emitter. Flaring created made the problem work. So they were flaring all the time. And they just didn't want to buy the technology that they could install um, that would have captured these gases so they didn't have to flare except in emergency situations. So CBE, so the, the community members said, you know, this, all the time they just, you know, we get these things, we got a shelter in place, we can't go out, close your windows, close your doors. You know, this, this was happening all the time. So we started a campaign, and our organizers work with people in the community to help get them organized. So we provide them, like, uh, training on uh, how the regulatory system works and all of this, and the fossil fuel system works, and then organizing skills. And then we have uh, scientists that kind of look at, like, environmental impact reports or emission reports uh, and provide technical information at the, in an accessible form to the community. And then we have attorneys that says, here's, your, here's the, the legal handles that you can use to help you in this particular case. So this is these three folks work together, but it's driven by the organizing. And for the attorneys and the scientists, they understand that their role is to help build community understanding and capacity because our number one objective is to build community power. We think that's the key to the transformations that we're working on. Anyway, we ultimately won this struggle. And on the, we had, had forced uh, some hearings at the Air Quality Management District. And when they were going to make their final decision, we brought a ton of people. We brought busloads of people. And they locked the doors. They said, we're not going to let you in. It's just that this could be disruptive and blah, blah, blah. And they gave a bunch of bureaucratic reasons. And we actually forced our way in. We said, you're either going to let us in or we're going to shut this place down. And they let people in. And lo and behold, because we had been arguing this for years, actually, 
we've been put, submitting uh, scientific expertise and we've been making legal arguments. And it, when that room was full of a bunch of angry people, black, brown, and Asian, and white, yelling, and, and, and they testified, and they testified with expertise, both their lived experience and scientific and legal knowledge that we provided, you can't believe how all of a sudden our research acquired a new validity and our legal arguments acquired a new validity with the members of the Air Quality Management District. So we've been making this argument for years, but until there was actual community power, they didn't listen to us. And they adopted the most stringent flaring regulations in the country. That was amazing. And those become the pattern. Once they're adopted, they become the pattern nationwide. And then we... Uh, but there's a process that you go through. So we immediately, the, the, uh, California is the third largest refinery state in the country, and half of those are in Los Angeles and half are in the Bay Area, in Contra Costa County. And we immediately put, um, uh, 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 started a campaign for similar rules in the Southern California Air Quality Management District, and they didn't want the Bay Area to, to uh, look more progressive. So they adopted even more stringent regulations, which now became the statewide. So it raised the bar. So I just want to give that as an example of how, as this, these changes happened in Richmond, because that refinery had been running for 100 years. But folks had never challenged their, their flaring until these new populations really um, uh, became activated in the Richmond community and achieved the significant so this was like the, the groundwork for, this was this laid the foundation for this campaign for both the electoral changes that, changes that happened at the city council and the uh, campaign that we raised against Chevron. So in 2008, Chevron said to the city, we have a project to really clean up our, we're going to modernize our refinery. It's going to be an amazing project where it's, we're going to, create about a thousands of new jobs. Uh, it's going to clean the air. It's going to, it's going to have all these incredible benefits. And, um, you know, because uh, a lot of the equipment at the Chevron refine is really old, like 70 and 80 years old, literally. I mean, it's just, you know, it's just ancient equipment. And uh, so our, our, you know, they, they, they had this out there. And so our community members go up and they said, um, you know, uh, it was uh, Ana Orozco, one of our organizers, said, Hannah, you know, uh, what's going on here? You know, we, we know that they say one thing, but can you check this out? So we had, uh, so we had a discussion in our, our, our Richmond team, again, organizers, attorneys, and uh, our attorney and our scientists, and they said to the scientists, check this out. You know, look at their application and see what it really is. And he checked into it and he says, this is total bullshit. This is total bullshit. He says they want to start refining tar sands. That's what this project is. It's actually dirtier than what they're doing now. It's going to be using dirtier grades of crude oil than they're using now. Because they're using all crude, all crude oil is dirty, but they were using a, a, a cleaner, less a lower sulfur content, and so on. And so he said they're, they're just lying here. That this is this is about you know getting the tar sands, getting the stuff the Bakken crew from North Dakota. That's what this is about. And it. It, it, they probably don't even intend it for, uh, you know, the domestic market. They're probably thinking of this as export. Kind of, uh, that's what that's the idea they have in mind. So, uh, we, so we we said, well, what does this mean? What is besides the obvious fact that this, you know, this is dirtier stuff? They said, well, the refining process is more corrosive, so it creates more dangers in the refinery itself to the equipment, and you've got this ancient equipment already. So this stuff is even more corrosive than the usual refining process. So they said, just on the level of the safety of the workers and the safety of the community, this stuff is bad. They said the second thing is that the refining process is incredibly energy intensive. You have to use more energy than you do for normal grades of crude oil. And it releases more toxics and more greenhouse gases. So he said, our estimate of the additional greenhouse gases so put into the air is from 900,000 to a million tons a year. And this stuff, you know, they've run it 70 years, or, you know, the, the old equipment. So just do the math about, you know, what the increase to do. And this is where California has what is considered the most uh, comprehensive greenhouse gas legislation in the country. It, it touts itself as the model. And yet here was Chevron going to add to that. 
He said, in addition to the greenhouse gas emissions out of those same pipes, it's going to increase the immediately toxic stuff. So the mercuries, the benzenes, and all this stuff that has an immediate impact, more immediate impact on people's health. So they said, this project is nasty. So we thought, what are we going to do? Because, you know, we knew from the flaring campaign it took years. It takes a lot of money. It takes a, just, it just, just, you know, they play hardball. And we knew they were going to play even harder ball on this one. They really wanted this. But, you know, our community members said, we're with you on this. You know, we, we, we'll, we'll do whatever we need to do. And we uh, were working with an, another environmental justice organization called the Asian Pacific Environmental Network, which has a base in the Laotian community. And they said, our members are down. And we approached another, the third, there's a third environmental justice organization that works in the, primarily in the African American uh, community in North Richmond, West Valley Toxic, said, we're with you. So we said, okay, the three of us together, and then we have our other allies from the environmental movement and other, you know, grassroots organizations and so on. And then we have a green mayor, and we've got friends on the city council now, so maybe we got a shot here. So we, uh, we, you know, did it, uh, we, we kind of submitted some comments on this. We talked it over with our, our, our members, and they said, look, you know, the main thing with us is our health is already bad. You just can't let them make our health work. You cannot put our kids at risk, any greater risk. He said, that's the number one thing. So whatever else, whatever other compromises we make, we can't put our kids' health at risk, at further risk than it already is. So we had a discussion about this, and we submitted some comments, and we said, Here's the problem with this application that you've submitted. It's going to create all these problems. Uh, and one of the things that it's going to do is it's going to raise the bar for all the refineries. Because ConocoPhillips and Exxon and Valoro and Texaco and British Petroleum, they're all going to say, Chevron, do we're, that puts us at a competitive disadvantage. If Chevron does it, we do it. So we said this is now going to become like an industry standard. So we, that was also what was at stake. And if that happens in California, Texas, Louisiana, all of these places are going to say, well, this is how we should, you know, we should be able to do the same thing. Otherwise, we're at a competitive disadvantage. So we knew it was really important to draw the line. And we started this campaign, and I would say there was a number of really uh, important dimensions to this campaign. So there was really obviously at the, at the city level, with the City Planning Commission and the City Council, we had to fight there. Even though the Air Quality Management District didn't have the ultimate say, so they had a voice in this, so we had to fight at the Air Quality Management District, so we had to fight regionally. We had to fight in the courts. There was a legal dimension to this. We had to file a lawsuit. We had to fight in the media, because in 2008, what was the big event that happened? Bam, the Great Recession. So jobs becomes the number one issue you know, everywhere to, to override everything. And then there was a statewide dimension to this because ultimately when Chevron thought they might lose at the citywide level, they said, we'll go to this governor and the state legislature and we're going to ask for a, what they call a legislative exemption from California's Environmental Quality Act uh, because of the dire nature of the economy. So because of the economic development that this will produce, we should be given an exemption from California, the requirements of California environmental law. So we had to fight at the state level, we had to fight at the city council and planning commission, we had to fight in the media, we had to fight in the courts. So there's all these dimensions, and all of these dimensions, obviously Chevron has enormous power. So I'll just give you an example. They were running full page ads in the Contra Costa Times, which is the local newspaper there that goes to a lot of people. And I said, fuck this. Let's run our ad. You know, we'll run an ad. We'll just get out there and we'll tell the truth. And so, yeah, they're $10,000 a pop. I didn't know that. I thought, the you know, New York Times would be 10000 But So that's just the kind of resources that you needed to contend in that arena. And they have, you know, obviously huge legal departments. When we would uh, meet with them for uh, court-ordered court, uh, mediation, the court says that, you know, you have to try to settle. Uh, they would walk in with, I'm not kidding you, eight, nine attorneys from I can't, uh, the Pillsbury Law Firm, which is the, the most expensive law firm in California. 
they were just all these suits would go into the room. So they had all this legal, and then of course they have all these technical experts, scientists, and so on, you know, ready to line up and sell their sell their souls. So anyway, they had this enormous, and they have obviously have a lot of political influence. They donate generously to both Democratic and, and Republican legislators and governors. So, you know, we, we, uh, when we met with our community members, we said, look, here's, here's the deal. You know, this is what we're up against. And we kind of did the whole power analysis and all of that. And we had to do this in three languages, English, Laotian, and Spanish. And it was especially important that we take into account in doing this kind of organizing, because our number one goal is to build power. So whether we, obviously we want to win, but whether we win or lose, we're trying to think of the long term, especially our long term vision of really beginning to transform Richmond's economy into a truly democratic, equitable, and sustainable economy. Because that's ultimately the only way we're going to defeat Chevron, is if there's an alternative. And for the, for the women that were getting involved, there was a number of, of issues, like for the Laotian women and the Latinas, um, uh, more so because they just have, uh, uh, they, there were just a number of like patriarchy and cultural issues that we had to deal with. So the idea that you, know, you can get out there and get, become active and go to meetings and all of that, you know, we had to make certain that we talked to the husbands as well. You know, because there's this is this was not so we so we had discussions with the members about how should we handle this because they said you know uh, I don't know if we can if I can come to the meeting I have to do this and my husband this and you know he doesn't understand exactly what we're doing and who am I meeting with and what are these about so we had discussions about that and we said well how should we have these conversations and who should have these conversations and then they said you know I come to the meetings and I bring my kids so childcare becomes a very important dimension and this is not like park the kids in front of a television. This is like community, like you know, valuing the children, seeing them as something really precious and essential. So the quality of the kinds of care we provided, you know, when you have meetings, where you have meetings, accessibility, plus the language issues. So you take the, the most recent environmental impact report we had from Chevron was 10,000 pages. So our scientist, who's got already workload up to here, has to analyze all of this and put it into something, put it into popular language, and then we have to put it into Laotian and Spanish. So these are the kinds of things that are absolutely essential for people to be able to be, become activated and involved. And our number one, the number one element of our organizing is to help liberate people's uh, already incredible capacities. So they're their creativity, their courage, their ethics, their political sophistication, all of these things that society generally suppresses and holds back in people, our job is, is not to like, you know, do anything more than help people free those capacities and use them both individually and collectively to figure out strategy and tactics. So this was kind of part of what our campaign was involved. So the first thing we had to do was go to the Planning Commission and we presented a number of recommendations to the Planning Commission. We said, look, this is what this project is really about. And they were kind of wishy-washy, but they, they, they finally adopted kind of a compromised set of proposals, but actually were mostly on our side. And then that went to the City Council, and there was a big debate. And, and what, the, um, what Chevron did was they did two things. They, they recruited the building trades to send up a bunch of their members to, to support the project. What were refinery workers, actually? The, it was the building trades. Uh, and, and, you know, their situation was, pretty, their, their unemployment after the recession was 50% and higher. So there was, a lot of their members were out of work. But they recruited a lot of the building trades member to come and say, we need this thing. You know, that's, that's really important. And they accepted, it's funny, before the recession hit, they had actually signed on to our comments. <laughs> but after the recession, they totally flipped and said, this is a good project, this is a clean project. We were wrong. Uh, and then they, they paid homeless people to come to the meeting and said they were community members who really wanted the project. And, and we just talked to them afterwards. We said, well, you know, our, our, our members would say, who are you? They said, well, I, you know, I, they, they gave me 25 bucks you know, to come to this meeting. So that was kind of 
And then they trotted out their attorneys and their scientists and all of this. So uh, ultimately, the city approved the project. So the first round, we lost that battle. Uh, but our members were there. They were there in force. Uh, again, these were mostly women. Um, came out in force. And, and, and this was, when I, when I say this, is because the building trades tried to intimidate them. Physically. They tried to physically intimidate them. You know, bad mouth them, holler shit, and try to provoke them and all that. So this was, you know, part of what we had to, uh, we were up against. And then, um, so we said, okay, uh, so we'll go to court. So that was the next arena of struggle, and we filed a lawsuit under the California Environmental Quality Act. And the, the thing about that is the California Environmental Quality Act says that it, it doesn't require mitigation of any project, but it, what it says is, did you do the environmental impact report correctly? And if you didn't do the report correctly, you have to go back and do a do-over. And that obviously, so this was going to give us, and we won that suit. We won the suit in the lower court, and they appealed, and we won on appeal. So even though this didn't give us mitigation, this gave us something that was very, very important for this struggle. It gave us time. Because all this takes time. And we used this time to continue organizing. And in the meantime, uh, the media, with the mainstream media especially, we were getting good coverage from Pacifica and the alternative newspapers there. But the mainstream media was killing us with like, you know, this is another example of the Enviro's irresponsibility. This is this great clean project that's going to create all these jobs in the middle of a recession, really going to help these poor folks in Richmond, and what are these folks doing? You know, this is another one example of irresponsibility and random movement. So we had to deal with that from what the Coastal Times, from the San Francisco Chronicle, the San Francisco Daily News, you know, some of the local TV stations kind of parroted what they saw in the papers. So we felt we have to contend in that arena because, you know, that influences public opinion. So um, what we did was we, you know, we, we sat down with our members and we said, okay, here's what they're saying. What do we want to say? What is the message that's mostly going to resonate? And we're going to go out, and it's not going to just be our scientists, although, you know, we use our scientists, we use our attorneys, we use our, our the organizers, they'll speak to the media too, but they need to hear your voice. <laughs> Why do you care about this? You know, do you care about jobs? You know, do you, just, do, you, do you care about these workers at all? So we worked out a whole set of messages, part of which is, had to do with environmental racism. We said, look, you, you wouldn't do this in, in a wealthy white community. You're doing it because we're poor, we're women, because we're of color. That's why you're doing it, because you think we're politically powerless, you think we're vulnerable, and you don't give a damn about our lives and the lives of our children. So that was one powerful message. They said, really, that's what's the issue here. And we don't give a damn how much money Chevron gives to nonprofits and to churches and all of that. This is what they want to do to the health of our children. <coughs> so the second message is they said, we do care about jobs. And actually, we've come up with a set of proposals that will create more jobs, and one of which was um, to replace the ancient equipment at Chevron with new equipment, and to replace a majority of their energy supply with solar, and to employ people from the community. So our proposals have actually created more jobs, longer lasting jobs, not just construction and then you're out, but longer lasting jobs. <coughs> so they said, we do care about jobs, but we don't think it has to be health, or jobs, the environment, or health. We think we can, there's a way to do this that's, you know, could benefit both. So this, our set of proposals would have reduced emissions, reduced greenhouse gases, and put people to work. So that was the other part of the message. And then there was other things that we had to, to deal with as far as local politics. So little by little, and we, what we did is within the mainstream media, we started to find people that were more open to our ideas. And we, our folks would spend hours with them, however much time they wanted. So if they would say, you know, well, we have questions about this technical stuff. We, are you guys, do you know what you're talking about? So our, we would tell our scientists, look, dude, you just got whatever it takes. You got to spend all the time it is. You got to break it down. And they would spend hours talking to these folks. So there was especially um, a woman reporter from the uh, local public radio uh, television station, uh, KCT, I think, one of those. She really got it. And she began to really say, there's an, I think there's another thing going on here. And I think, you know, our investigation shows that Chevron's double dealing here. 
And one of the things that we shared with them is that while Chevron was insisting that this had nothing to do with tar sands and dirty crude, and we had actually said, would you put it in writing? And they said, no, we won't do that. But we found that they had given a presentation in New York City to a bunch of their investors, and when they, which they said, the number one purpose of this new project is to refine tar sands. <laughs> and of course, we ran the court with that, and we ran to the media with that. And so, so we began to shift the, the, the media. Their, their attitude began to change. Their article started to change. And ultimately, there was uh, an op-ed in the San Francisco Chronicle that said, this is a bad project. These folks are right. Chevron should either come clean and change the project in the way that would be really beneficial, or they should drop the project. So that was another arena in which we began. We were fine. So we beat them in the court. We beat them in the media. We were just kind of holding our own. And then, uh, then when the elections came up, uh, there was a big, there was an organization called the Richmond Progressive Association, which organized a big campaign. Our members and others got involved. And we changed the city council. So we had the green mayor. And we split, the city council was split. Three, three, and one. Three for Chevron, three for us, and one in the middle. So this was a whole new ball game because the one in the middle was more vulnerable. So this was a whole. So this was another big change that happened. And then what happened was the the court ordered mediation didn't go anywhere. So we actually. I know I want to make another point just about labor, just so you know, because I, I you know said they didn't play a very good role in this. Uh, we met with the building trade unions several times, all, always at our initiative. We asked for the meetings. And we had, before we uh, put, made these proposals public that would have created more jobs, we shared it with them. And we said, because when we first met with them, they were just really just all over us and we didn't care. And they were telling us how much dues they had lost and their members out in the street and Christmas is coming. And, you know, Christmas is coming for our folks too, yo. you know. And um, so we said, well, look, we're going to take you seriously. So we said, we're going to go back and we're going to work on a set of proposals that we think actually can work. And we brought it back and they rejected it. Chevron will never do this. This is just totally unrealistic. You're crazy. You know, what's this? We said, well, maybe they'll do it if we work together. If we walk in together, you all and us, that's pretty powerful. And they wouldn't do it. And I just, there was an interesting kind of exchange because. Sandra Satern, uh, this uh, young uh, Laotian single mother organizer for the Asian Pacific Environment, Environmental Networks, she was sharing with them some of the concerns from the community, especially around the high rates of uh, childhood asthma. And she, she, you know, she put this out there. She said, look, this is why this is so important to us. And this guy goes, ah, oh, you know, I, I just, I always hear this stuff about children's health, children's health. You know, if those parents would, would make their kids walk to school instead of, driving their lazy asses, you know, maybe they wouldn't be so sick. I, I can't believe I heard this. You know, and I got to say, when we met with them, so our delegation was primarily uh, uh, black, brown, and, and Laotian, uh, they brought 19 people to the meeting. I think they were trying to intimidate us. And all guys, and all but one were white. And we're like, dude, I mean, just their thinking. <laughs> Just kind of a little cultural sensitivity. So anyway, so this, so what happened was, so but I just want to make the point that we really took the argument, we really took the question of jobs seriously because it is a, it is the number one issue in our communities. I mean, it is the number one issue because our folks have massive levels of un, un, unemployment and underemployment. So we have a bunch of folks who work full time plus and still are in poverty. So we we, under, we, under, we understand that probably as well as anyone. So uh, when things just seemed to be stalled, we were stalled at the court, and we thought, well, maybe Sheraton will appeal again. That's just going to take more you know, resources. And you know, we're going to have this big fight at the city council and, and all of this. Uh, so we went to uh, our, some of our friends in the state legislature, and they said, look, would you maybe convene some uh, mediation? Would you guys do it? Because then maybe Sheraton will take it more seriously, because they certainly didn't take the court order seriously. So um, the, we went to the President of the Senate and the Speaker of the Assembly and they said, yes, we will do that. So 
<coughs> they designated an assembly person named Michael Fuhr, who was going to be the mediator, and they gave him some staff support, and they said, we will, you know, we will hold the mediations in Sacramento, so it's outside of Richmond, blah, 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 neutral site, and, uh, you know, whatever it takes. So at first, Chevron blew him off. And we're like, these are the most powerful elected officials in California. That's, that shows you kind of both corporate power and arrogance, that they're ready to blow it off. But somewhere along the line, they just thought, oh, you know, we better do this. So they finally, after initially turning it down, they agreed to the mediations. And uh, uh, that's where, so when we went into the mediations, it was very interesting what, what the mediators did. Um, what 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 they did, and I, I don't know. You know, I want to just I don't want to uh, question his motives. I think he's being very sincere. He kept saying, "How much money? You know, if we set up a community benefits fund. How much would you want?" And we, uh, well, we said, "You know, we we definitely want to discuss that. You know, we, you know, because this community needs resources. We definitely want to discuss that. But that let's do that later." Public health first. Let's talk about the public health measures first, because that's exactly what I'm thinking. Well, well, are we talking 60 million? So, you know, we we find we just insisted. We said, no, we have to talk about the public health. That's the first priority from the community. So, um, you know, we had some discussions, but every time we would go into mediations, he would always start with that question. You know, if we have a community benefits agreement. And we actually went back and we said, look, this is what's, this is what's happening at, at, in these mediation sessions. And they keep talking about the money. And the, the, unanimously, from the black community, the Latino community, and the Laotian community, is that's later. Public health is number one. You can make a lot of compromises. We're, we give you guys the authority to make all kinds of compromises. You've got to bring whatever it is back to us. But we give you a lot of leeway. But that's one that we can't compromise on. And they didn't want to compromise on the greenhouse gases either. They said, you know, the planet is at risk. So ultimately, anyway, we went through a whole set of uh, mediations, and we put forward a lot of proposals, including the ones that we had before, which would have, <laughs> the funny thing was, they would have actually made Chevron's operations more efficient, <laughs> as well as cleaning them up and creating jobs. But Chevron, I think their perspective was, we can't give an inch here, because if we give an inch, they want a mile, which is true. You know, we're going to leverage this victory for, you know, to, Continue. <coughs> so ultimately, we went back and forth, and we, you know, we tried different kind of compromise proposals, and finally, we just uh, we said, look, this is the bottom line. And while all of this was going on, our gov gubernatorial elections were happening, and Jerry Brown was running for governor again. And one day, I get a phone call, and he says, "This is Jerry Brown." And he says, uh, "Have we met before?" And I said, "Yeah, I met when you were running for president." And uh, I really, you know, uh, respect the thing you did for the, for the farm workers because the Agricultural Labor Relations Act was some of the best labor legislation in the country. So he says, "Look, what the hell's going on, Gallegos? You know, we're, you know, this this project is really important, and we think that there's, you know, there's there's got to be room for a common ground here and compromise and blah blah blah." Anyway, he just berated me for like 20 minutes, and I, you know, I listened and trying to be respectful, and I said. You know, uh, you know, uh, Governor, I, I hear what you're saying. Uh, I, here's our perspective. You know, we've made. I explained all the compromises we had already made. Why public health was so important. Why the greenhouse gas was so important. And then I said, I hope you're calling Chevron and giving them the kind of hell you're giving to me. And he says, Who's giving you hell? Who? Who? who what are you talking about giving you hell? I mean, he just kind of. So that kind of ended that conversation. <laughs> and then when, when the mediations finally ended, when we just said, this is it, with the bottom line, take it or leave it. And Chevron said, we're not going to take it. That ended the mediations. We got a call from, so the, Michael Fuhr called Jerry Brown. I guess it was out jogging. And he says, do you want me to come over? And we said, no. Unless Chevron is going to move, there's no point in, in having him come over here. And he had already been elected. So, in the, so there was this, what happened was Chevron knew they couldn't get, because the, the composition of the city council had changed, Chevron knew they couldn't get the legis statewide legislative exemption. 
Because the only way you can pass a legislative exemption is if the local city leadership agrees to it. They'd say, look, are you okay with this? If we exempt this project? And they knew this new council, they might lose. So we closed that door off. So that was, so I just want to give you a sense of those were all the arenas in which we had to fight this out. And finally, it's just shortly after that, Chevron dropped the property project, they pulled the application. So this was just an incredible, incredible victory. So I want to just, uh, real quickly, I want to just talk about some of the lessons from this. So one of these, I think, is, and this is an issue that came up yesterday, I think it's important, is it, is it uh, appropriate to raise race as a central issue? You know, because we did. We really emphasized the environmental racism of this project. We said it's not just a bad time. It's not just bad for the environment, it's not just bad for greenhouse gases, but it's really particularly bad for these vulnerable communities. I would say yes. That turned out to be a winning strategy that rallied all progressive communities, including the white, including the white community. Um, I want to say that, you know, while I want, we emphasize that issue, we never uh, lost sight of the intersectionality of class and gender, because since the, the majority of people in the in the hearings and in the, in the struggle, and the leaders of this were really women, we really emphasize that. That there's a, because the health impacts are, are also gender specific. There's, you know, for miscarriages, low birth weights, uh, you know, other kinds of problems. The rates of breast cancer and so on. Um, I also think one of the important lessons from this and it's, is building social movements. So I know there's a lot of experience here there's a big struggle going right now, on right now against right to work and against the cuts in education and Scott Walker's thing before, is the importance of building infrastructure. So we, we it's, it's, you know, there's different times, there's different kinds of uprisings. You know, you have the Occupy movement and you have the different things where struggles just spring up, like Black Lives Matter. It's a really incredible struggle that's going on now. But how do we sustain that? How do we sustain that beyond a specific campaign, whether we win or lose? How do we build leaders in a systematic way? How do we uh, create the support systems that we need? How do we, you know, what are the structures that we create that can sustain a struggle over the long haul? You have to build those. You have to build those. This was a difference that we always have. So in the environmental justice community, it's very different from the big green groups, the mainstream environmental community, in that we really emphasize organizing in low-income communities of color and poor white communities, where they focus more on lobbying and legal and media and so on. But even with groups that are more on, on the more a, uh, mass action side, the more direct action side, like Friends of the Earth, we've had differences with them, not because we think that those kinds of tactics are, are necessarily wrong, you know, the kinds of uh, you know, uh, uh, civil disobedience and other kinds of tactics were wrong, but because we think it belittles the importance of organizing and building infrastructure. That it's great you know, to stop the logging you know, with the, the tactics that they used and all that, but you, in our view, you have to build people's power. That ultimately, this is a question of democracy, of building the, the, the voice and the capacity of the majority of people. And we emphasize communities of color. But that means you have to create organization. I think that's very, very important. Um, and then I think the, there's the importance of having an affirmative program and message. So in addition to, to saying this is a bad project, it's going to put all these. So California has terrible air quality. 18,000 to 24,000 people die every year because of our air quality. People don't have to die. So just think about that. If you go with the 18,000 figure, that's six World Trade Centers. <laughs> every year from poor air quality. And the majority of those are people of color. So that's, you know, that's, that's really, really terrible. And, and, and then, of course, you know, the planet is at totally at risk. Even British Petroleum, I read an article today, they said that greenhouse gas emissions are going to increase by 25% over the next several years. They said it's just, it's just a, a done deal. But you have to have, in addition to what we're against, and we've had this discussion with Bill McGibbon from 350, that it's not just divest, it's invest. We have to create, we have to have an affirmative program of what we're for. So throughout this campaign with Chevron, we said, here's another way. Here's the way to clean up your operations, to begin to create more clean energy sources, to put people to work. So we had an affirmative element to the program. And this was connected to our longer term vision that 
we have to create an alternative economy in Richmond. Because while we may win a battle here and there with Chevron, they're still the dominant power there. <laughs> they still get their way. The, the year that we won this campaign, their profits were $29 billion. So we gave them a kick in the ass, but they, they ain't hurting. So we really feel like it's important to have that affirmative program and to have a vision. And that this vision, ultimately, what we need to, our challenge is to think about how all these visions that are happening all over the country and all over the world, how do we learn about them and begin to connect them so we have more of a societal vision? Of this is the kind of way we want to live and uh, our relationship to Mother Earth. And then I think the other important lesson was that you really have to really pay attention to movement building. So, well, the, the three environmental justice organizations were at the center of this project, and grassroots people were at the center. We had allies from the mainstream environmental community, from NRDC, from the Sierra Club, from the SEIU, so not all labor was, was, was um, uh, opposed to us, from public health, from, you know, so from uh, earth justice and uh, academia. So you, we really saw the importance of ACE, which used to be ACORN. So we, we really saw the importance of building a broad front, you know, that we, we, we can't win alone. We need as many friends as possible, and that should be an important part of all the work that we do. And then, I think this part about creating an alternative economic infrastructure, because just to give you an update, Chevron came back with a new project, and they, and they were approved. And we fought it, and we got a number of uh, mitigations to the project, including a $90 million fund. So for a city, a small city like Richmond, which is that's a great deal of poverty. This is a lot of money. And 60% of that money is supposed to go towards uh, 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 toxic and greenhouse gas emission, so clean energy and community gardens and all that. And then the other part is the community determines what they want to use it for, so creating more park space or whatever. And we also got some other mitigations. But we lost on some very important issues. So in the year after we won this campaign, the Chevron refinery blew up. It was a big fire and explosion, and it sent uh, 15,000 people to the hospital. So it's out of 100,000, 15,000 people out of the hospital. So we had said that uh, if Chevron is going to do this new project, the re replacement of that destroyed infrastructure and all other similar infrastructure has to be tested to see if it's sub uh, susceptible to the corrosive impacts of these dirtier grades of crude oil. And if it is, you have to use something else. So this was a big one, because we'd said this is a safety issue, it's a health issue. Anyway, we didn't win that. So, uh, and there's a long explanation to that, because uh, you know, this is a progressive city council that kind of accepted this norm. Actually, the planning commission had unanimously accepted all of our proposals, but the city council didn't. So I, the point I'm making here, though, is that you know, Chevron still exerts enormous power. And then until we can create a really a viable and sustainable economic alternative, we're going to be fighting these battles all the time. So that's it. So we've got about a half an hour for questions and answers, conversation. Anybody want to take the question? Yes, sir. Um, what is the lesson for cultural distinctive communities that are facing because I'm reflecting, for example, on the uh, people in the state of Louisiana that faced uh, the BP uh, spill. BP paid all the workers and all the fishery communities. We went with the service learning program called UW-NOLA in 2010. And we went with Wilma Subra, the, the environmental scientist. And she confirmed that she was shot in her, in her home twice after she testified to the US Congress. And the, the communities in Louisiana could not uh, mobilize because most of the people who would serve as witnesses uh, were already under contract. People also, also at the lower nine wards after Katrina, uh, there were $126 billion of federal funds given to the state of Louisiana, but none of these money went to the impoverished communities, African-American communities. Most of the areas that were remodeled not even suffered any damages after Katrina. All the FEMA money was subject to a lot of corruption. We have here in the state of Wisconsin, the mo community mobilization because of, of the Crandon mine and, and, and the, uh, the Oreo 
mined also by, by the Ojibwe communities, was also limited because the grassroots movements didn't align uh, ally massively to them. And we have uh, in the in the Menominee Nation, for example, we have a conflict problem with uh, European American communities surrounding the reservation that are contaminating the lakes because of the invasive species, the, the recreational boats, pesticides, etc. So what's the lesson for the communities? What the communities can do effectively when you have a scientist who uh, support that is nothing else, nothing wrong happening, when you have uh, governance that it's, it's not hearing the constituents? What the communities can do effectively? Well, I, I think that's a very good question, and I would kind of throw that back on folks here from Wisconsin, and you know, maybe Arnold, you could address some of the what is going on there. Um, the, you know, the, the easy answer for me is obviously you have to really you have to organize people, and you have to you know do, build a movement to, to support. But that's that's kind of a general prescription. What it looks like here in Wisconsin, I just don't know the conditions, and I don't know the. The situation and what or, what is the organizing hi history here? Hi, my name is Arnold. Um, I am a member of the Nomad Tribe. Um, back, oh, I don't know. Um, probably won't get these dates right, but when we were fighting Exxon with the Cranion Mining, for instance, um, the collaboration that it took to defeat Exxon. Um, in that endeavor, let me let me remind you that Exxon came into this state and rewrote every mining law that was on the books at the time. Um, that same collaboration has to occur no matter what the cause or what the fight is. There was no way that the Menominees, the seven bands of Ojibwe, um, the, the 12 tribes here in the state were going to win that battle on their own. It took people from Madison, from Milwaukee, from all over the state. And I think, likewise, um, <coughs> the Menominees have been dealing with, uh, with the, the effect of termination. We were terminated as a tribe. Um, as a result, we have this Legend Lake on our reservation that is, I'm going to say, 85, 90% non-Menominee. Um, there's a lot of retired expertise out on that lake. And, and We've learned very slowly over the years that um, neither the Menominees were going to go away and nor are these folks that live on Legend Lake. And I think to, to somehow, some way, we kind of made it through the storm together. And now we're, we have people from Legend Lake that are, that are actually spending time at our, at our high school, which is 99.9% .9 Menominee. Those people are up there, they're helping out with the students, they're, they're mentoring our people um, with the evasive species issue. There are people on Legend Link that are getting involved, that are helping in that endeavor. So I think it's it's collaboration, and, and we, we have to stop um, thinking that uh, we're going back to wigwams and, and the folks on Legend Link are going back to Europe or wherever. we got to start looking at Mother Earth as ours, and, as a entire group. Um, so I think those issues that you brought up, every one of them very real, um, are being fought at different levels in different places and nobody's connecting the dots. You know, again today I was up at the Capitol and I'm, there's such a, a, a divide from the leadership to the rank and file. I, I hear the leadership saying one thing and here's the rank and file as I'm moving through the crowd I'm hearing Descent. I'm, this I'm is the rally against the right to work. Right, yeah. and it's just a, it's a matter of all of us, you know, getting out in the world and, and, and forcing those dots to be connected. So I, I don't think there's a one answer to your your questions, but I, I, I know that when Exxon was defeated, it was a, a collaborative effort by everybody in this state, and and today that property where all of that what they wanted to mine is now owned by two, that, that property is, the title is owned by two tribes. Uh, they bought up that land after the fight was over and when, the, when the title was free and clear, nobody was trying to get it. The two tribes, the, the uh, Siskog and Chippewa 
and the Potawatomi um, bought that land up and so now it's safe, you know, for now. But we got the fights up in, in uh, uh, the Bad River Indian Reservation, we got all of that mining, um, the issues all over the state. So again, it's, it's collaboration and a lot of what he spoke about. So there's many, many fires that are going on simultaneously and we got we got to tend to all of them. So. Thank you, Arnold. And I want to just say that, you know, <coughs> I shared the example of Chevron, but it's, you know, it's, it's not just the oil companies. This is a systemic problem. <laughs> this is a capitalism problem. Sure. But I just, you know, Chevron is kind of a good example of how that system can work. You know, controlling the media, controlling the legislature, controlling political apparatus. You know, they're just, it's systemic. And, you know, and, and our, our um, members know that even if we shut down that refinery tomorrow, their schools still suck. You know, the cops are still beating up their kids. You know, so there's just, it's a systemic change that we're working towards. But I think it also gives us a sense of where the social forces for those changes can come from. Yes? Yeah, um, my name's Trisha O'Kane. I'm involved with an environmental group on Madison's north side, about 20 minutes from here, called Wild Warner, and I work with middle school kids in an environmental education mm -hmm. program. Um, everything you've said the last two days has been so inspiring to me. Thank you so much. Uh, I'd like to know more about the changes you talked about in the city council. You said that that was critical for shifting yeah. this struggle. And I mean, Madison, we just had our primary for mayor a week ago. The, the voting was like 10 or 11 percent. It was among the lowest in Madison's history. And I, I, I really think what you're saying is, is true, that that's where change starts. Could you talk a little more about the yeah, nuts and bolts and how you changed the dynamic on that city council? That's pretty amazing. Well, I think, you know, part of it was, you know, building a, a movement on the ground that has fought in so many different arenas. So they fought in the, we fought in the regulatory arena and the electoral arena and the court. We fought in all these different spaces. Mm -hmm. So people had acquired quite a bit of um, experience in that. And then I think they saw this electoral, uh, people recognized that there had been a change in the electorate. So there was a greater, a much greater proportion of black, Latino, and Asian voters. And... All the polling is consistent. When you poll uh, African American, Latino, and Asian communities and Native communities on environmental questions, they're always way up there in terms of supporting strong government action, understanding, taking climate, seeing climate change as a serious problem, much, much higher than the white community. Mm -hmm. So folks knew this. And so some folks said you shouldn't make Chevron an issue because they're so, you know, their economy, they're so much important part of our economy. But because folks had this lived experience of what Chevron did to their, their neighborhoods and their children, I mean, just imagine a 3,000 acre operation running 24 seven. So that's the sound of trucks, of machinery, of, I mean, just the smells, everything is running all the time. So this was really kind of the, uh, it, it gave us the capacity to contend in this arena, which is another arena that Chevron has controlled, and to really begin to say, these are the candidates we want. Now, ultimately, what we would what like is because Gail McLaughlin is clearly the most progressive, is really grassroots candidates to be able to run. Because it's, it's the same way. There's usually not a very high turnout mm -hmm. compared to what it should be. But it also means that, you know, 1,000, 2,000 votes, you've got it. You know, you can, it, it can be the difference. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of how we're, we're looking at that. Is this, how do we use this arena to build power? Now, the interesting thing is, when the city council changed, we actually got a number of different, they got to adopt a number of different policies, and the city manager and the city staff would stymie them. They just wouldn't do them. Or they would, they would come up with some reasons not to do it, or they put it at the bottom of the stack of their paperwork. So there is the kind of, uh, you know, they, over the years, they had just, Chevron had developed all those relationships with people. So even though you kind of get these political decisions, implementing them actually take, took a lot more struggle. Yes. Um, how did you go about, or what would be a good way to find your friends to make those connections with allies? Because even other movements as well, allies are the most important thing that you can have. It's what gives you strength. So that's a very good question. So, just in terms of the, the building itself, the way we usually start is when, let's say we have a, a meeting with our members. This, let's say they're all sitting here in this room. We usually start with, okay, who do you know that we could talk to that would support us? 
So they usually start with family, friends, soccer club. So by the time you're finished with that discussion, you've got a, a, a list a mile long. And then we say, what business people do you know? What other organizations do you know? So we, we, we rely on our members first with kind of creating our list of both supporters and allies. So usually, you know, if they're active in their church, they say, well, I'll talk to our pastor. You know, if uh, they're, um, they know folks at a community clinic, I'll talk to the folks at the community clinic. And then, you know, we looked, we do our own what we call power analysis. So we try to say, okay, who's on Chevron's side? Who's on, who's on our side? Who's potentially on our side? So we do an assessment of the labor movement. We do an assessment of the green groups. And then from that, we identify folks that we think can be allies. So we do all of that as we're developing the strategy for our campaign. So, and then we, you know, we have a, uh, we usually, because we want, our, our organizers have to do a lot of it, but we also like our community members to get the experience of working with folks outside of their comfort zone. So we say, why don't you come with us for, with our meeting to the Sierra Club? Because we want the Sierra Club to have a, you know, understand the direct voice of the people, not not just through our organizers or through our attorneys or whatever. So we try to build that experience. And one of the things that we do is we say, there's common interests and then there's divergent interests in any movement. And so there may, there's going to be conflicts. So let's try to identify where the, like for example, our differences with the National Resources Defense Council. Here's, they're agreeing with us on this, but they may disagree with us on this. How, do we, how should we handle conflicts that come up in the movement? Because that can kill a movement if you don't know how to handle differences. But we always try to educate our members about this. So I know how to do it just because I've been doing this for so long. But you know, you want everyone. This this is part of what it means to be a leader to understand how to work with not only your neighbors and your friends, but but other sectors of society. So we do pay a lot of attention to that. Because you're right, we can't we can't win alone. I mean, we've we've bumped heads hard with the National Resources Defense Council, but on this issue, they were with us. They had our backs. And that was really important to us. That made a difference. You know, because we don't, we don't have a base in the white middle class community. They do. Yes, sir. My name is Jonathan. Um, I had a question about, I work at METC. I'm also a student there. And I work as a peer advisor for the Trudeau What program. is that? A peer advisor. No, what is that, the group you work for? MATC. Oh, I go to school at MATC, and I work College. for. Oh, Madison College. Okay. Technical yeah, College. I'm sorry. And I work for a TRIO program that's in uh, MATC, and it's, it's to help uh, first generation, low income, or students with disability to um, you know, help guide them through school yeah. because they might never have that experience before. Mm -hmm. So they're taking this work, uh, this load of like school, and they're working, they have kids, especially at technical college. Yeah. Um, you have people from 18 to you know, 80 years old, and you know, they're trying to get involved in school, so that's a big step for them. And my big thing for them is to show that they do have a lot more potential at schools a lot, but they still have a lot of potential energy to do stuff actively in the community. Now, my question to you is, for those mothers that, you know, single mothers that have two kids, or, um, you know, they got to work, how do I, or what would you do for your community to empower them so they can, you know, be part of those movements, the Chevron movement? Because yeah, I see that big, like, lack of... Well, I, there's other experience. Claire, you've done a lot of that kind of work. You want to talk a little bit about your experience? Yeah, I mean, you've already kind of talked about it a little bit. Why don't you just introduce yourself? My name is Claire Tran, and I um, was an organizer in Oakland, which is right across the way from Richmond, California. Um, and I work primarily with youth, but in all of the organizations that I um, ally with that work with adults, they always have, they always have food, they always have childcare. There's always a way to participate um, that addresses their the things, the conditions, and the challenges they, they face, including um, in Oakland, the city's very divided, so rides became important too. So I think um, addressing those immediate uh, conditions. Do you get help with that kind of stuff, like uh, travel vouchers or uh, uh, just their childcare for? No. And I know you brought that up, and that was like, you know, that did hit me really strong uh, because they feel like they don't have the support already and it's hard for us because, you know, we're a grant program and I'll be hosting two events because I also work with Wild Warner, I'm a member there. And um, so 
my first step was partnering these two, just to you know get their foot through the door, and hopefully they find their own, like their piece of the puzzle where they can you know shine. Um, but yeah, we don't have like you know like that's really important. I was like, yeah, it care. raises a really important issue because I know that governor wants to do all these cuts on higher education, and it, it seems like there's like the first fight is to stop the cuts. But I, it seems like there, this is a chance to really put forward a, a different vision for higher education that would include all of those things you're saying. Is that if we want these um, members of our society, these women, these single mothers, blah, blah, we want them to participate, then there needs to be support for that. And we need to fight for that. And in addition to fighting the budget cuts, just as, you know, for the status quo, there should be, I, like I would think, just, you know, my little time on this campus, it could use more diversity. <laughs> You know, so really fighting to get more black students, native students, Asian students into the campus, <coughs> I think should be part of that division that we really want a higher educational system. And, and our folks, you know, because of uh, the, our economic situation, usually need support systems when we come in. So I think it's good because you're providing, I think, which is one of the most important ones, which is like the spiritual and social support. Because it can be really hard just coming to a campus and trying to figure it all out. But you do need those things that Claire talked about, you know, like, you know, the, how do you get to class? How do you, you know, get your kid to child care? How do you, you know, all of those things. Yes, Tom. Um, in, your, in your campaign to, uh, my name's Tom, um, influence the uh, council elections there in Richmond, were you able to increase the percentage of people that vote? I think we've seen in the last midterm election that the conservative message brought people out to vote so that, uh, so that we have a disaster in this country. Lots of people simply think it's a waste of time. So how how, how can we yeah, possibly in, change that? Dynamic? In the communities where we organize and where Richmond Progressive uh, Alliance organized, the turnout was higher. It was, and this you know it's funny you know you, you like you organized for years and oh, God are we having an impact? And this actually told us we were having an impact because people did come out, but it still was low. It was increased, but it was still low. A lot of folks just feel like the point, you know, and they just, they, they haven't seen a real alternative for so long, and, and I don't blame them, you know, they, it's just like, they, you know, we had this city council, then we had this city council, then we had this one, and I'm not feeling any difference. So we have to kind of work through all of that. <coughs> yeah, Claire. Um, I wonder, because Chevron is one of those companies that is, you know, it's global, and uh, people, it's a buzzword, uh, it's kind of, rem that struggle is reminding me a little bit of the Immokalee workers um, and their uh, campaign for uh, higher wages for the tomato pickers, um, which really, like, uh, targeted uh, Taco Bells yeah. and was able to get um, students to get Taco Bells uh, contracts ended with their universities as, a, as part of their strategy. So I'm wondering about, like, sort of, were there ideas or are there any possibilities of larger strategies um, because of uh, ruining Chevron's image and broadening that struggle <laughs> out? Uh, and also, you mentioned the, um, that other states, that this was the, what is that? I can't remember what the word is either, but that Chevron in Richmond was the testing ground for yeah. what they would do in other places. Yeah. So were there interstate alliances with organizations who were fighting Chevron? Yeah, in their that's a good question. So um, in terms of the larger thing, there is uh, greater and greater efforts to start to connect different struggles together. And when I, I want to give you all a, a handout from, from uh, one of those new organizations. It's called the Climate Justice Alliance. And then these are the environmental justice yeah. principles, uh, which I was going to read from, they're all very inspiring. Yeah. Um, but this is, the Climate Justice Alliance is a national uh, network of grassroots organizations and others. So this like includes like progressive think tanks like Movement Generation and uh, progressive media organizations like Social <coughs> Story Based Strategy. So it's, it's got a, it's a diverse mix, but it's primarily grassroots. But the idea is to create a nationwide network of grassroots struggles from throughout the country, including in Alaska and Hawaii and other places, to really highlight the development of grassroots solutions to the climate crisis. 
as opposed to market-based solutions, and to eventually link all of these struggles together into a national push for national climate and energy legislation. So that's the idea. So that's one of the areas where we're trying to do it. Um, I think in terms of like, we haven't really thought about uh, uh, how we could utilize the Chevron thing in the way that uh, the Monte workers did with Taco Bell, because that was a good one. And Chevron is like the great, greatest poster child. I mean, they're screwing up in Africa, they're screwing up in Latin America, they screw up throughout the country, you know. So they really are, but we haven't really, you know, actually media communications has been one of our big points in terms of how to do this. Now, I, I think, I've, I want to, I've been trying to encourage people to write a book about this whole Chevron thing, in you know, a novel that could actually get, reach more people than like my case study. Um, but, yeah. And I wanted to say, Jonathan, I know where you're coming from because my, my, uh, my older son went to culinary school at LA Trade Tech, and he told me, Pops, if I'd had a family, then I couldn't have done it. I just didn't see how I could have done it. So, yeah, we need those support systems. Do folks know what the Immokalee worker struggle is, by the way, everybody? Could you just kind of briefly just um, say what it was? Well, the Immokalee workers is mostly uh, women led uh, Latino workers in Florida, and they. Um, they had a, a campaign. Um, the tomato. tomato uh, the tomato workers. pickers, uh, in particular, had a campaign um, to raise wages because they were making like slave wages, basically. Um, and and that struggle has uh, continued to Trader Joe's as well. But I, I think that they've settled that. <coughs> I'm not sure. But anyway, um, they realized that the tomatoes uh, that they were picking were going to Taco Bell's. And, uh, and Taco Bell is uh, more widely known, so they use that as a target um, for, for their wage campaigns because they were using intermediary organizations that were controlling their wages. But this was a, a way to uh, get it out uh, broader that this um, was happening. And so uh, one of the tactics uh, in building allies is that they uh, educated students about what was happening and then got those students to push to end contracts with Taco Bell. And so t Taco Bell was like feeling it where it counted. Yeah. Um, so that was a big piece of their campaign. So. so instead of like taking it farm by farm, they, because Taco Bell would tell a farmer, this is what we're going to pay you for, your, for the tomatoes. And then the farmers would say, well, we can't pay you more because Taco Bell. So they hit Taco Bell. Mm -hmm. and the, the condition was, if Taco Bell's going to pay the farmers more, they have to pay the farmers more. So just to make a plug, in two weeks from tonight <laughs> at the Union South Marquee Theater, free and open to the public at 7 o'clock, is a film called Food Chains, which is about that campaign. Um, so I would strongly encourage you to come to that. And while I'm talking, tonight's film <laughs> is called um, Out in the Night, and it's going to, we always have these films with a discussion following. And the person leading the discussion is M. Adams from the Coalition of Young Gifted in Black, who's leading the um, Black Lives Matter campaign here in Madison. Um, and then next week is a, an environmental film called Return of the River, which tells the story of the, the dem demolition, the biggest demolition of a, of a dam project in the history of the world in Washington State, which was a coalition of white and native communities that got together to make that possible. That's a week from tonight. So, yes. Um, so I, I, my name is Aide. Um, I had a question regarding kind of it's, it's really cool to hear that there's a community that gets together and there's an environmental issue and it's people of color <coughs> fighting against, uh, against that, but not so far away from Richmond. It's the Central Valley and there's the water crisis yeah. as well. Also, with uh, the same environmental issues with the kind of caveat that's going to be more jobs if you provide water and if you continue the industrialization of agriculture and those kind of water systems. And I guess I wonder if you've seen any kind of movement that follows something like Richmond or kind of how do you address a problem that is, is providing jobs for that area and not the most social just jobs, but it's also an environmental issue in terms of water. Yeah, so that's a really great question. So um, this 
Central Valley is the huge agricultural, one of the huge agricultural areas of California. Uh, uh, agriculture is uh, just a, one of the largest uh, economies in California. So Silicon Valley, agriculture, Hollywood, all of that. And there's a great organization that organizes in the Central Valley called the Center on Race, Poverty, and the Environment. You know that? Yeah. So um, a lot of the organizers are ex-members uh, of the United Farm Workers Union. So the issue she's talking about is uh, the world has a water crisis. That's a part, one a part of the ecological crisis that we're facing. But California has a very severe water crisis. Uh, as I mentioned, even with all the rainfall and whatever else, we we only have 20% of the necessary water supplies that we need um, right now in California. So some cities are actually having these small towns are having to, to uh, import water. And 70% of the water in California is used by agribusiness. <coughs> so they have everybody in Los Angeles like, don't flush your toilet for the next week. Stop taking showers. You know, don't wash your car. That's bullshit. <laughs> Nobody's wanted to touch agribusiness. And finally, the crisis becomes so severe that now people are starting to say, well, maybe we have to change the, the policies. So this is another example of where the, the, the capitalist system works in such a voracious way because agribusiness has had no uh, legislative uh, mandate to conserve water, so they just waste it like crazy. And what they're not just wasting in the, in the most you know, uh, horrendous ways, they're poisoning with pesticides and herbicides. So this is really where the, the center, if you want to know where the central area where you need to solve the water crisis, and it is folks in the Center on Race, Poverty, and Environment, the United Farm Workers Union, irritated residents of the, uh, Fresno. Uh, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I forget that, I can't remember their name exactly. But there's, there's groups out there that are actually, there's the Environmental Justice Coalition for Water that have been pushing this for years, and finally they're starting to get some traction. But we'll see what happens. Even Jerry Brown has said maybe we Yes, yeah, uh, I see takeaways at the end there. You spoke about uh, advancing the idea of the environmental racism as, your key, as a key point to uh, your success. And I'm wondering if you could maybe speak to the framing and uh, the creation of the idea and how you presented that to your adversaries uh, in a way that it was well received as opposed to just being called a racist. Yeah, well, with, with folks, just basically they argue the basic thing is they said, look, why does our community seem to get all the freeways, all the oil refineries, all the bad projects? That's just not, that's just not fair. But what they also said was, we get it the worst, but your kid has reduced lung capacity. We have really, really significant environmentally related health problems for all communities. Our communities are the worst. Uh, California is an art light ninth largest greenhouse gas emitter in the world. So what they were saying is that, you know, yeah, let's start where the problem is the worst, but it really has a much broader impact. So they, they, they really tried to make this point. So we always encourage our members to talk to uh, folks from other communities that usually just drive by but don't know the reality. And we always say, you know, emphasize with them that you're neighbors, you know, that you share a lot of common concerns and interests and that's how usually we talk about it. We say, look, they really wouldn't put this, this kind of operation in Pacific Heights in San Francisco, really, a super wealthy uh, white community, or they wouldn't put it in Palo Alto. So, but they should put it anywhere. It's not like we want them to put refineries in Palo Alto. They said we should really be getting off of fossil fuels and having cleaner. And so even now, there's, the state is doing a massive build out of solar energy. But it's, traditionally, it's just gone to the suburbs and the wealthier white communities. We're saying they should get into the poor urban and rural communities as well. And that actually is beneficial for everyone. So we kind of argue it. You know, we, we emphasize this question because it really is important. But um, I said there's a broader impact for everyone. So just like when, the, when the, the Black Freedom Movement won the Voting Rights Act, that really helped us, our community, the Chicano community. When they won affirmative action, that opened up higher education for white women as well as for people of color. So it, it can have a much, much broader impact, I think, in general. Just one more thing before before I call on you, I want to just uh, because I forgot to do this yesterday. If any of you want to just get together with me, I have an office over in on the this, other side this building in eighty one nineteen. Yeah, um, and you could just reach me at that email address. And these are some references. So if you you know you've got nothing to do, you can read all these books. 
<laughs> Robert Bullard is, a, is an icon in, in the environmental justice community, Dr. Robert Bullard. Uh, and he's written uh, a, 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 this really well-known study called Toxic Waste and Race. And then he did another one called Toxic Waste and Race at 20, and Environmental Health and Equity. So that's kind of an environmental justice. These are like outstanding works on environmental justice. Uh, Ecofeminism by um, the great Indian ecofeminist Vandana Shiva. Uh, Enemy of Nature, great, great book that I think is a precursor to Naomi, Naomi Klein's recent book by Joel Cobell, who used to be at Bard College. Uh, Marx's Ecology by John Bellamy Foster, professor at Oregon, which really talks about uh, the question of alienation, what that does to us to be alienated from the land and from nature, and how that impacts us in such horrendous ways, and that our this, the, kind of the ideal society we create should really end this alienation that we have from our work, from each other, and from Mother Nature. Um, and then uh, Naomi Klein's new book that just came out that's getting a lot of play, This Changes Everything, Capitalism Versus the Climate. And then this is an unpublished speech that I have but that I'll give you if you hit me up called Reflections on the Green Economy. So there you go. Very Maestro. Quick, quick one. In yes. How you fund these environmental causes? How you, in the process of fighting capitalism, how you fund nonprofits, activists, yeah. <coughs> media campaigns, and, and all? Yeah, teachers. okay. So that's a good question. So how do you fund this? So uh, Communities for a Better Environment is a nonprofit. We're a, what they call a 501c3. We're a nonprofit organization, which means we're not supposed to do electoral work. Or we're restricted from doing certain kinds of electoral work. So we have to be very, very careful. About that. But, uh, and we get, uh, our legal department is funded through lawsuits. So when we file a lawsuit, usually if we win a settlement, we don't get the money. We usually, the agreement usually says we have to do something else with the money. So we either create a community fund, or in two cases, we gave it to progressive foundations to give out to community organizations. So we gave $8 million to the San Francisco Foundation for environmental justice work, and we gave out something like $5 million to Liberty Hill Foundation in Southern California to create their environmental justice program. But the fees that we get pay for our attorneys. But that's, they can only do that in shared costs. They can't, they can't pay for our organizers and all that kind of stuff. I wish they could, but there's some legal limits on that. So that pays for our, the rest, and then 65% of our income comes from foundations. So that's a problem because foundations are trendy, they're committed to the status quo. You know, this week it's fracking and next week it's urban gardens and you just don't know. And we don't want to deviate from our mission or pretend that we're something that we're not. So that's hard, we're always struggling. But what we're trying to do is really build up our, our, um, our donor capacity or think of other creative ways. So one of the ideas that we've had that we haven't been able to see through fruition is creating a co-op in Southern California that would, because bicycling is just blowing up, they're putting off, they're increasing bike lanes like crazy and it's just going up everywhere in all communities. So we thought about doing a thing where we get old bicycles and rehab them and then sell them uh, and use that to help pay people off, get them a good job and also <coughs> fund our work. So it's, it's tough though. And the, I, I mentioned yesterday in my talk that of all the foundation money that goes to environmental work, it's actually a pretty, pretty small percentage of overall foundation funding. About 98% goes to the green groups and about 2% goes to grassroots groups. So there's a big... So we're over time, but... Uh, we'll One last question. There was a recent ordinance in Maui which banned uh, growing of GMO crops. Do you know how that was organized? It must have been indigenous people, basically, that voted for that ordinance. I know there's been a real... Uh, pretty consistent uh, uh, Hawaiian sovereignty movement, the movement for Hawaiian self-determination, but I don't know that particular story. Is anybody familiar with that? I definitely want to investigate anything that's going on in Hawaii firsthand. <laughs> Before you all leave, I just want to remind you that there's a third opportunity to talk about all this stuff, but in an unstructured, anything goes kind of conversation tomorrow at 1220, on the other side of the building in 8108. Um, so that's an open forum seminar. You guys set the agenda for the conversation. All right.